Nick's timekeeping uh, was so good and I remember distinctly he was playing this ar kind of constant arpeggio that's kind of running 16th notes um, on the guitar pattern and it was apparent that he, it, there wasn't any point in, in, in reproducing that on another part of the drum set so I chose to kind of do a more colour thing with um, uh, timpani beaters or on, on the drums and the cymbals and play more colours rather than try to play time as such, although hopefully it's kind of in time. They sing a song for Hazy Jane She's back again in my mind The songs were lying There's a couple of songs on the album that are, kind of are more, I think, are dramatically more relevant to life as it's lived now, as it was then, and um, and they're, they're actually both Hazy Jane one and two, which is weird in itself. Uh, Hazy Jane one, which is just this fantastic, it's like a, it's like the questionnaire you really don't want to address because it tells you a bit too much about what you've sacrificed in order to kind of keep up with modern life. Do you like what you're doing? Would you do it some more? And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of makes you ask very fundamental questions about yourself. And just so beautifully, and, and Robert Kirby's arrangement, I just, it's just absolutely ravishing. And then again, he does the same thing on Hazy Jane 2, and I don't know if this is deliberate or coincidence, but, but to be able to just, the, you know, all that business about waking up in the morning and the world it gets so busy that you can't look out your window in the morning. I mean, that's just... How, how did he know? <laughs> that's just, just how life is lived now. This, these are the, the sort of anxieties that you have. John Cale's arrangements on Nico's The Marble Index had made a great impression on Joe Boyd. Cale had heard Nick Drake's music while working with Joe Boyd on the Desert Shore album, and he insisted on speaking with Drake about a collaboration on the songs Northern Sky and Fly. The partnership proved successful and produced two of the strongest tracks on Brighter Later. I love the thought that if Nick, brilliant as he was, had been able to work with more collaborators, I mean, look at the great work he was able to do with Robert Kirby. If you listen to Northern Sky, and particularly Fly, you can hear the, 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 the effect of John Cale's imagination on Nick's songs. If he'd been able to work in partnership with some other people, where then might his music have gone? I'd like to touch a little bit on a song called Northern Sky because it's, it's been heavily touted by people as being one of the finest love songs ever written. I mean, it's almost childish, it's very simple melody. I think his, lo his love songs are referring to both flesh and blood and nature, actually. Inner feelings, which never quite manifested themselves. But now you're here, bright in my northern sky. The reason that the music sounds so beautiful is because it was all imaginary for him really. You know, when he was writing these songs that do evoke these sort of beautiful wind in the willows-esque sort of dreamscapes of sitting by rivers and, you know, watch, watching the, the flowers wag by. He, he was up on Haverstock Hill, up Haverstock Hill in Hampstead, you know, where the you know, buses would have been playing up and down. Um, and, you know, he would have been walking past pokey news agents every day. You know, he wasn't living that bucolic life. It was all imaginary. And just as he could imagine these, these beautiful sort of dreamscapes, these beautiful musical uh, soundscapes, he could also imagine being in love. And that's probably why it sounds so real, because it's only when you get to, um, to Pink Moon that it feels like the world's becoming kind of fleshy and real to him. Before then, everything's quite dreamlike and imagined. Um, and it, it feels like there's, there's a state called being hypnopompic, where you think you're awake, but you're not, so your dreams seem real. And the, the Drake stuff is very hypnopompic. But Nick Drake was not always in control of his songs, and often reluctantly agreed to musical additions and embellishments advised by Joe Boyd. For the song Poor Boy, Joe Boyd suggested an approach similar to that featured on Leonard Cohen's So Long Marianne, which included a mocking chorus of girls' voices, a quite different sound to what Nick Drake had envisaged. You 
in amongst the fact that, that Nick Drake um, is still a fragile, meaningful singer-songwriter, they, they actually set out to make a record that has bass and drums and, and that could be accessible. And in some ways they did it, and in some ways they didn't. I think that, that it's quite cluttered. And nobody sees how shaking my knees. Nobody cares how steep my stairs. Poor Boy is a great song. People like to try and say that it was done ironically with all the uh, backing vocals of P.P. Arnold and Doris Troy. But, you know, why did he need irony? I mean, I just don't see the necessity for that at all. He uses a lot of uh, melodies that are quite sort of in major scales and things, whereas you'd expect it to be like this you know the sadder lyrics to go with mine you know and any sort of plays with that so it, things can feel upbeat and stuff and then you hear the the words underneath that and it's a real nice play between between the sort of the melody and and the lyrics there are some people in my opinion that if you add one other musician to them you diminish their impact by half if you add four, you diminish their impact by, you know, three quarters. And it, it's cumulative effect. It waters it down. It doesn't make it bigger. It doesn't strengthen. The central message is borne out by Nick's way of composing an open-tuned guitar, which will give it all the width that he needed, and a poetic lyric sat on the top. You know, that's what he wanted. That should have been enough. Add in a conga drum is an irritation to some people, you know, or a flute. It's, well, why, why am I listening to this w whistling away when everything I want for this song Nick has put there? I hope he agreed to it willingly. At the time, possibly because some of the other musicians were more well-known, shall we say, than Nick, he may have felt that him and his songs were getting Swamps, swamped is, is a too severe a word, but maybe we're getting kind of uh, overshadowed to some extent by the other, you know, stars on the record. On November the 1st, 1970, Nick Drake's second album, Brighter Later, was released. Yet once again, poor marketing and a lack of public visibility meant that sales remained low and reviews as vague and dismissive as they had been for Five Leaves Left. The general tenor of the reviews was, oh, you know, another album for Nick Drake. Uh, immaculately produced by Joe Boyd as ever, uh, brilliantly engineered by John Wood, another interesting addition to the Island roster. That was pretty much it for all of them. You know, Nick only ever gave one interview, uh, which was monosyllabic and unrevealing. He never ever spoke about his songs, which I think is one reason why um, his, his legend grows with each passing year, because he's so completely enigmatic and inscrutable. I mean, he's this blank canvas, he's whatever you want him to be. Because there aren't any diaries or letters or journals or interviews, everything is speculation. And I think that fuels the myth. My memories of the interview are, are um, it was, of all the interviews I did during that period, it, it, was, it was by far uh, the biggest non-event. Um, I don't think Nick was reluctant to do the interview. I think Nick was just being Nick. I found it very hard to communicate. Um, I seem to remember he, he shuffled in in a, I think it was a great coat on, a, a long coat, you know, with the, the kind of familiar Nick Drake stoop, and um, I don't recall ever making any eye contact with him. And oddly, the only time he got quite animated, I think, was um, when we talked about Brighter later, and I don't think he was a man who who felt he was going downhill at that point, but I do think that he was beginning to recognise the hopelessness of it all. Um, clearly the album had taken far too long to make, that he did communicate to me. He also communicated that um, doing more gigs to help promote it wouldn't help the situation. I mean, clearly he was fearful of doing these big um, concert hall venues. Um, 
and he was already preparing for a reaction to this record which was very, produ very highly produced and had pretty much the kind of which season I mean to call them the house band is pretty unfair but a lot of familiar people who had played with John, John and Beverly Martin uh, Mike Kowalski and Paul Harris and the rhythm section of Fairport Convention he wanted to strip that right back just go in quietly and privately to sound techniques with John Wood and make a solo acoustic record and um, it was I think when, when I spoke to him it was at that point he became quite positive he was already looking on to the next record I don't think he, he was he just was so uncertain in the end of what Brighter Later was going to mean to the world I think he really believed this was going to be the one that would do it for him and I think when it didn't that's that's when the shadows began closing in I think he really felt you know come on guys I mean this is this is quality stuff you know why aren't you getting this and I think it's it's failure did did mark the beginning of well beginning of the end really I mean um you know, it's four years, it's within four years of the release of Brighter Later, he was dead. Despite the failure of Brighter Later and Drake's increasing reluctance to perform in public, he surprisingly agreed to appear at a series of dates with friends and fellow label musicians John and Beverly Martin. And in March, Nick even embarked on another tour to support Sandy Denny's new band, Fotheringay. As with previous attempts, the touring proved unsuccessful, and after three concerts, Drake told Joe Boyd that he could do no more. Indeed, his concert performing came to a final halt on the 25th of June, 1970, at Edwell Technical College, where Ralph McTell was headlining. I remember the gig very well, because um, I was already sort of doing quite well, and I'd begun to move out of the folk clubs, and I was doing the colleges, and I was particularly pleased that Nick was doing this one with me. He was part of the show. And I remember him singing the songs and playing beautifully, very hunched up, head down. As I recall, about halfway through, he just stopped, got up, turned right, and walked off the stage. I was puzzled because the audience was attentive, quiet, respectful, clapped in the right places, and, uh, um, and I said, uh, I, I think I said something to him, was everything all right? He said, oh yeah, or words to that effect, that he was okay when clearly he was something had upset him or, or he'd come to the conclusion that showbiz wasn't for him or, you know, performing in public wasn't for him. The creative process was its own reward, it seems to me, and that he was a very reluctant performer, although he could have been a great performer because he had that sort of sexy quietness and introspective, marked-for-death romantic poet look about him, and that's what his music was about. I think he could have put more into his career. I think he waited for somebody else to, to, to tell him what to do. And when they did, I don't think he wanted to do it. I mean, that's very... But I don't know when the, la the, the lack of desire to perform came from. Because it's certainly what wasn't when he was younger. Having stopped performing altogether and troubled by the failure of Brighter Later, Nick Drake was slipping even further into an unhealthy state of mind. And so in 1971, when Joe Boyd left for America and sold Witch Season to Island Records, Nick returned to his parents' home in Tanworth in Arden, no longer able to cope on his own. Joe Boyd got made a very good offer by a Hollywood film studio and left in the early 70s. And I think Nick felt that was, saw that as a betrayal. Um, but I don't think, in fairness, Joe knew just how fragile Nick was. And when I was doing my book, I spoke to Linda Thompson, who was sort of Nick's girlfriend uh, at the time. Um, and she just said, well, you know, none of us knew what, you know, mental illness was or breakdowns or depression. Or you know, we were all young, you know, we were all smoking dope, you know. It, it just didn't occur. You know, Nick was just really cool. He just came and sat there and didn't say anything. We thought, wow, that's really cool. At that point, he was aware that he was not going to achieve the recognition that he thought he deserved. And I, I did get that kind of weary f feel of resignation then. And, and then off he went in, and, and made Pink Moon and it was just a throw. But I, I really believe then it was downhill, although I like the album.